I'm in the opening section of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago. He's talking about his own arrest. And um, he doesn't do a whole lot of talking about himself in this book. Very surprising in a way because this is a guy who lived in the Gulag. He knows the Gulag from the inside. He does use his observational insights. And of course, he recounts all kinds of testimony by other people. He also has a deep psychological understanding, but he doesn't refer to himself a whole lot. In fact, right after this section, a relatively brief section where he talks about himself, he says, this is not going to be a volume of memoirs about about my own life. But for this reason, because he is so, um, he, he does not focus on himself when he does, in the rare times that he does, it's always very revealing and very important. So I'm going to go through this section a little bit slowly. Mine was the easiest imaginable kind of arrest. It did not tear me from the embrace of kith and kin or wrench me from a deeply cherished home life. He goes, one pallid European February, happens to be, by the way, the year 1945, it took me from our narrow salient on the Baltic Sea where, depending on one's point of view, either we had surrounded the Germans or they had surrounded us. And it deprived me only of my familiar artillery battery and the scenes of the last three months of the war. World War II is coming to an end. Solzhenitsyn is fighting for Russia. He's fighting in the Red Army. And he has, even here, you see that whimsical, ironic, you know, he goes, the battle, I couldn't tell you. Either we surrounded the Germans or they surrounded us. I don't really know who had the other surrounded. But anyway, there was kind of a battle ongoing. And guess what? That's when I got arrested. And so the point he's trying to make here is, for a lot of people, the arrest is downright horrible because you're in some comfortable, trusted surrounding. You're at home or you're at work or you're at the local club or you're drinking some vodka with friends and they burst in and they grab you. So you're wrenched out of this comfortable, familiar, warm surrounding. But Solzhenitsyn goes, it wasn't like that for me. I was actually, you know, at the, at the battlefront. So I was yanked out of the battlefront uh, three months before the war came to an end. Let's see what happens. The brigade commander called me to his headquarters and asked me for my pistol. I turned it over without suspecting any evil intent. When suddenly, from a tense, immobile suite of staff officers in the corner, two counterintelligence officers stepped forward hurriedly, crossed the room in a few quick bounds, their forehands grabbed simultaneously at the star in my cap, my shoulder boards, my officer's belt, my map case, and they shouted theatrically, You are under arrest. Wow. So soldier needs in here. Uh, would you turn over your pistol? He's happy to do it. He's, he's military people are trained to follow orders. It never even crosses his mind. And then boom, these guys jump out, grab him, take away all his other military insignia. You are under arrest. That kind of poignant phrase which defines this whole chapter. Burning and prickling from head to toe, all I could exclaim was... Me? What for? So he holds Solzhenitsyn, and he is Solzhenitsyn, and yet he responds the same way everybody else does. Me? What for? And I'm sure going through his mind, is this some kind of a mistake? So all the normal human emotions, the gullible emotions, the, the sheep-like emotions that we have when we are faced with this kind of calamity, Solzhenitsyn has it too. And even though there's usually no answer to this question, surprisingly, I received one. So here is Solzhenitsyn saying, normally when you're arrested, they don't even know why. They, you're just on a list. Go get this guy. Uh, but he goes, in my case, I actually got an answer. And let's see what happens. Uh, he says, there's a brigade commander, his own military superior, standing across from him. Solzhenitsyn, come back here. With a sharp turn, I broke away from the hands of the men, the smirsch men. This is the guys arresting him. I stepped back to the brigade commander. I had never known him very well. He had never condescended to a run-of-the-mill conversation with me. To me, his face had always conveyed an order, a command, wrath. But now it was illuminated in a thoughtful way. And the brigade commander says to Solzhenitsyn, you have a friend on the first Ukrainian front. Now, this is a really important clue because Solzhenitsyn suddenly realizes that now he knows why he's being arrested because he said something to his friend who's on the Ukrainian. So he is able to place the exact um, time and circumstances of his offense. Now, the counterintelligence guys jump in and they go, it's forbidden. You have no right. They're shouting at the colonel saying, you, you can't tell him anything about the arrest. But 
right, Solzhenitsyn, but I had already understood. I knew instantly I had been arrested because of my correspondence with a school friend and understood from what direction to expect danger. And then, right, Solzhenitsyn, my commander, Zakhar Grigorovich Travkin, could have stopped right there. But no, he says, standing erect, he rose from behind his desk. He had never stood up in my presence in my former life, reached across the quarantine line that separated us and, ga and gave me his hand, although he would never have reached out his hand to me had I remained a free man. And pressing my hand, he says, I wish you happiness, Captain. Now, this may seem like an unimportant incident, but it's really not. Basically, Solzhenitsyn's superior is expressing sympathy, is expressing solidarity. He's saying to Solzhenitsyn, listen, I'm on your side. I wish you well. And even though he can't do anything to help him, even though Solzhenitsyn is going to go off to the gulag, it means so much to Solzhenitsyn that this man, who he didn't even think cared about him. In fact, he normally encountered him where the man is sort of up here and Solzhenitsyn is a lowly um, fighter is down here. The man never speaks to Solzhenitsyn, never engages in any even even pleasant uh, pleasantries with him but now in the moment of crisis this guy steps forward and he goes in effect i wish you well solzhenitsyn and solzhenitsyn remembers this and brings it up right here in a critical opening section of the gulag archipelago Vladimir Putin called the U.S. dollar's drop in dominance objective and irreversible as Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa formally agreed to use local currencies in trade instead of the U.S. dollar. Well, this is the first shoe to fall as demand for the dollar weakens, the buying power of the dollar weakens. And this is why Birch Gold Group is busier than ever. Investors and savers like me are looking to harness the power of physical gold held in a tax-sheltered IRA. Debbie and I buy our gold from Birch Gold. We trust them to help us diversify and protect our savings. Text Dinesh to 989898. You'll get a free information kit on gold with thousands of happy customers, an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews, you can count on Birch Gold to help you navigate transitioning an existing IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold. As the U.S. dollar continues to receive pressure from foreign countries, digital currency, and central banks, arm yourself with information on how to protect your savings. Text Dinesh to 989898. Claim your free information kit now.